<laughs> Excuse me. Sorry, I I can't uh, help you right now. Okay, that's fine. All right. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. I just realized that um, it wasn't going through to Twitch. So I restarted the broadcast and here we are again. I'm live. I'm alive as well. <laughs> Good to see you. I was wondering why the Twitch chat was so dead. I was like, after weeks and weeks of me kind of putting Twitch chat versus YouTube chat, YouTube chat was always winning because I was asking questions and uh, <laughs> Twitch chat just didn't get to the answers fast enough. So I thought you guys had officially resigned, but it turns out we just weren't connected. Okay, like I was mentioning, and I'm happy I didn't uh, go on to speak about the Philidor defense yet. I was waiting for the pleasantries. Good to see you. Not helping you, smart sky, that's not true. Um, but yeah, like someone said in the YouTube chat, people don't take the Philidor defense seriously. And we're going to see the likes of Maxim Vashila Graf play the, the Philidor, or I think it was against the Philidor's defense. Philidor defense. Um, yeah, he did. But Said Abdel Ate, he's the one who played the Philidor's defense. I don't know why I say Philidor's defense, anyway. Um, but the one game that really stood out to me and something that I remember by heart, one of the first games that I had memorized was the game from the, <laughs> the 19th century. Is it the 19th century? It is the 19th century <laughs> in, the, in the late 1800s where Paul Morphy played against the two Dukes. Do you guys remember that? I think I mentioned it more than once on the stream. We're going to speed through that game in particular only because it is the opera game and uh, it was also game of the century and uh, it's it's so memorable and Paul Morphy played against two people at the same time who then obviously communicated with each other to find the best move against Paul Morphy and still lost so that was pretty cool so as you mentioned it's not a highly respected uh, opening on a top level but what I think I'm going to do with you guys is go through it um, from both perspectives, because I don't play it with the black pieces, but I do play against it with white. And I'm sure a lot of you, you guys do too. So I'm going to show you some, some tricks in the opening, if your opponent doesn't know what they're doing, and uh, with white pieces. And also we'll go through the basics as black. Okay, so after a little bit of Wikipedia research, I learned that Philidor was indeed a person. They named this opening after a person. And that person's name, I'm going to try and get this right, is Francois André Donican Philidor, who is a French composer and chess player. Let me check, because I don't have this open. I'm going to see if I, I said it correctly. Francois André Danican Philidor. Okay who advocated it as an alternative to the common knight c6. Yes, I'm owning it. <laughs> we are going to speak French. Bonjour. Comment ça va? <laughs> no pug slide. Unfortunately not. There's no BTTV emotes here. So I'm going to close that window. Coach of the century, February, about to drop more chess knowledge bombs this evening. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. You guys are too sweet. Pippinchuk. Am I British? Not at all. Not at all. I am from South Africa. When your Daniel Duboff plays it seriously. To be honest, when you are a high, highly respected chess player, even if you play the bunk cloud, people will believe you. If you say it's the best opening out there, because if you can play it at a top level super tournament, super GM tournaments, and still get a draw or a win, then by all means, uh, popularize <laughs> the opening. Because it, then clearly it's not about the opening, it's about your style of play, how aggressive you are over the board, or just how, how simple, solid and satisfying you're keeping your chess. So... Never play the Philidor? Well, don't say that. Okay, here's the deal. We speak about the Philidor. 
We discuss the full it all from both sides. We go over games where white has won, we go over games where black has won, and then we come to a conclusion, because I feel as though I don't know the full truth about the fiddle door. We are making assumptions based on other people's opinions. And what if you end up liking the opening altogether? Who knows? And also I'm going to show you um, how it was initially intended to be played and how it is played today. So let's take a look. Wikipedia. I know, always believe what's on Wikipedia. <laughs> no screws. The Philidor has one big plus point. It's not the... Don't bring that in here. MVR is playing it against Italian now in uh, SCC. Well, it is the Speed Chess Championship, so you never know. Hi from Bangladesh. Hi. Yes, I am from Hashtag Chess. How did you know that? Always trust, you only trust Wikipedia. Wikipedia. Okay, so um, the game that I said I have committed to memory is the game I aim to show you today. And that is between uh, Paul Morphy and the Two Dukes. But we'll speed through it because I have gone through it weeks ago. And I, I only hope to, to go through it with you guys and uh, hope that you will commit it to memory just as I have. So we're going to see it from White's perspective because Paul Morphy was playing the white pieces. And in addition to that, he also completely obliterates his opponent. I'll stop at the end tactic. I'll just go through the basics of the opening. And since we're discussing an opening, I also want to um, just brush up on the opening principles and make sure we're all on the same page. So in the opening, we, we know that the center is the most important and the best way to control the center is to occupy it. And the best piece to occupy the center with is a pawn. And the reason that is true is if another pawn comes along and attacks your pawn, you are not absolutely forced to capture it. Even sometimes, okay, sometimes it's, it's better to capture, but sometimes it's okay to just leave the tension in the center and you're not forced to move the piece. So if you have a knight in the center, that would be great, or a bishop or a queen, but if it can be attacked easily by something that is um, less valuable, you want to you want to make sure that uh, you're not losing tempo, right? So if it's being attacked in the center, you'd have to move it again, and you're losing a move by playing that. So for instance, if we play e4 and our opponents play d5, Let's play it for a second. D5. And then we go ahead and we play... I'm just making a very, very... Okay, let's let's play queen f3. And now they're capturing. We capture back with the queen. And you go back to the rule and say, Well, I'm controlling the center. I'm occupying the center, just like you said. But this time with my queen. Because it's the most powerful piece. Now my argument will be, What if knight f6? The knight is less valuable than the queen. The knight is worth three points versus the queen nine and you will have to retreat that queen or move it again so let's say you decide to play queen a4 and you're like well now the queen is checking the king the queen is also um controlling d4 and e4 and it's check well you'll have to move the queen again because after bishop d7 it's being attacked and you're losing tempo you're lo losing tempi here um and what is tempi tempi is time in terms of moves so you're losing moves and now you have to move the queen again and we have to look at white's position and black's position black has now developed two pieces compared to white's one and the king is nowhere near uh, getting to a safe place so we really have to pay attention to that and that's why i say controlling the center with a pawn is the best way to go pawn center is the best center so the two dukes decide to play e5 against Paul Morphy and uh, the people in the rival YouTube chat knowing hash. That's, that's quite amazing, isn't it? I like that. I'm like really stoked for this lesson, Noel. When can you do good stuff? Cannon fodder lesson? That's not happening. Hi, Total Cutie. How you doing? 
Tempe of the Soul of Chess? Interesting. Alrighty, well let's get back to it. The second principle is developing your minor pieces. And uh, Paul Morphy really enjoyed going over the minor pieces. Um, if you're part of my master class and uh, you've received the folder that kind of talks about opening principles, the do's and don'ts and stuff like that, I have added this game in the booklet, which is quite insightful. And here we have the Philidor, the move that makes it the Philidor, uh, the move that François André Danikan Philidor has played and uh, has, what was the word that was used? Um, orchestrated? Is that it? Philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> oh la la <laughs> yeah I think YouTube chat has just stopped what happened what happened we we got a one she speaks French let me make sure we're on the same page There we go, I'm not seeing what you guys are seeing. We are here. Yep, I've had to open up a new chat. Thanks. Let's just bring you guys over this way. Paying attention, that's very good. I'm happy. Okay. Let's go. Alrighty, I'm very happy that you guys are here. So we have D6. And the best move, well, what is recommended here against the Philidor, the best move is d4. And that's exactly what Paul Morphy has done here. But also, we have to note that another good move that is recently being played is bishop to c4. And why is this move so great? Because after a move like knight f6, which is a huge mistake, white can simply go knight g5. And I'm pretty sure that this is good for white. Black will have to play bishop e6. Or d5. I'm not sure what the best move is. d5 is the best move. But imagine having to play d6 and then d5. I don't know so much. I feel like it's okay for white. So that's why black usually has to play bishop e7. Hi everyone. Welcome, thanks for being here. Screws is in the YouTube chats. Exactly. <laughs> Hi. Hey guys. Okay, so let's go back. Paul Morphy plays d4, and the usual move here is to capture, but black decides to not capture. Instead, he's like, okay, you're attacking my pawn. Let's draw some arrows. You're attacking my pawn on e5. And if I capture back, I know you intend to take the pawn with the knight and you're up a pawn. And that's when he decides to play, or they decide to play, bishop to g4. And here Paul Morphy is like, well, this is still possible. Watch me capture your pawn. So what is the idea behind this? Is if black captures back, white will simply take the queen first. Of course, if he captures with the knight, he gets checkmated on d1. So capture, um, after d takes e5, we capture the queen first, king takes, and then knight takes e5. So let's play those moves real quick. So we have d takes, then we have queen takes queen, king takes, which is forced, and knight takes e5, threatening f7 and g4, respectively. So then black will have to retreat the bishop to e6 or h5, trying to defend both sides. But the whole advantage here is... Not only is white a pawn up, but also black's king is in the center and has lost the right to castle. So in this particular position, it's going to be much better for white because black will find trouble or have some trouble um, getting the king safe. All right, so let's go back. And <laughs> naturally, black saw this and decided to capture the knight first instead. Only there's something that we know about bishops and knights. 
Bishops are better in the long run for the end game because they have more range. Knights are good when the position is very static or closed and the knights can jump between pawns and just um, do its thing, control, maybe some outpost and so on. But here the position is completely open. After queen takes f3, of course we're not going to capture with a pawn and the reason for that is we are left with double pawns and double pawns in the center as well. But it's double pawns we don't exactly need and it's it's not something we have to do to ourselves because there's really no need. And also this pawn is all alone. Um, there's nothing adjacent to that pawn on the file to protect it. So the only thing protecting this pawn is the rook, which is a little sad, right? He needs his friends. <laughs> so queen takes and d takes e5. And here we reach a position where it's okay to have your queen near the center because nothing can attack that queen directly. So what we want to do here is simply play bishop to c4 because it is a multi-purpose move. We are attacking f7 with the queen and the bishop threatening checkmate. So already black is forced to make a decision here and here he decides to play knight f6. Also saying to white, well, if you play multi-purpose moves, so can I. So here the bishop not only attacks f7, it develops as well as um, prepares the king for castling. And also there's some nice um, positive complementary dynamics going on here be between the queen and the bishop. Knight f6 kind of blocks this attack. But um, white is still fixated on the f7 pawn and decides to play queen to b3. Why is d5 bad? e takes d5 h6 and the knight has to move. We take d5. E takes d5. Um, are you referring to the beginning of the game? I'm not too sure which move you're referring to. Does the best defense, the great offense ever apply in chess? Um, I don't know. <laughs> hey Blitzgang, double pawns, double double pawns, we be <laughs> Black should resign here, I think it's over, oof, sus, trap, trade queens ASAP so that we're on endgame and use my stonks in knowledge from Jesse's masterclass, well that's good, that's good, exactly. She doesn't see what I posted in YouTube chat. What did you post in the YouTube chat? What did you post in the YouTube chat? Screws. I don't know. I don't know. Alrighty. So queen b3 is a bit of a double whammy because we're attacking on b7 as well as f7. Of course, we want to protect the pawn that is closer to the king first. Pawn on b7 can fly, that's fine. We want to play queen to e7. Queen e7 is going to protect f7. The thing is, if we go ahead and protect b7 instead, we run into this problem of checkmate. So king e7 or king d7 runs into queen e6 checkmate. And that is just such a short game. That is seven, eight moves. We don't want that. So after queen e7, I mean, white could simply take on b7, but he said, I'm not being greedy here, but I prefer to develop my pieces because with development comes some kind of compensation. And uh, if you're ahead in development, that could be equivalent to a pawn. And that's what he prefers here. Of course, there is a better way to go. Bobby Fischer did an analysis of this game and I watched a video where he was analyzing it um, against, uh, there was a one of those magnetic boards against the wall and he was standing in front of a class and was kind of explaining it and I really loved the way he went on. He spoke about bishop takes f7 and after queen takes f7 we can now play queen takes b7 and it's okay because we're running the rook. There's no way to defend. Um, previously I think if this was done beforehand after queen takes b7 there is queen before check which we want to avoid because we don't want to trade queens. Um, with white pieces, maybe there's a chance to still win in the middle game. And why would you want to go into a slightly winning end game and still have to struggle a pawn up, right? So instead, bishop takes f7 first. There's no more queen before check. And now we take on b7 and win the rook. And I quite like that line, but it wasn't played. 
So queen e7, and here knight c3 was played. Knight c3, um, it stops queen b4 check, as well as protects on e4, and just controls the center, and it's, it's better to develop a piece than to go pawn grabbing anyway. So after knight c3, black decides to protect the pawn on b7 with this very beautiful move c6. So what it does is it stops knights, uh, white's knights invading b5 and d5, as well as allows the queen to kind of swing over to b7 if need be. Um, that pawn is no longer free. <laughs> Checkmate is unfortunate. For sure, checkmate is a problem. Exactly. <laughs> Screws. Exactly. Great tactics. Great tactics. Alrighty. So let's continue. Of course, we have only one minor piece left. And we want to play bishop to g5. Um, just keep in mind, guys, this is committed to memory. So it's better to learn a, a game like this, especially game of the century of by heart. I haven't yet learned um, the one that Bobby Fischer played. In 19, I'm going to botch the date. Let me find it. I bet you I can find it. Uh, Fisher. Was it 1963? Yeah, I think it was the 1963 game against Reuben Fine, which was... No, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was Robert Byrne. Robert Byrne versus Bobby Fisher in 1956, the immortal game. Um, game of the century with the windmill tactic. That's what it was. All right. 1956. See, I haven't even I haven't even learned that game, but it's something that I aim to learn at some point in my life. Uh, just, uh, just for the record, you know, to be able to to speak about it without having notes of any sort. Never mind the whole game. <laughs> right. So here. Um, black is, is finding some difficulty developing, so the knight can't move because it's being pinned to the queen. Um, we can't move this knight to a6 because bishop takes a6 and black's pawn structure is in shambles. Knight can't go to d7 because the queen will capture on b7. So there's a, little, a lot of difficulty if you push the pawn on g6 or push the pawn on g7 to g6. Um, you'll find that this is a lot of pressure and the bishop has to come out somehow. So he decides to um, throw the ball in white's court and say, well, I want you to retreat. I really don't want you in my territory. Get out of here. And also allows knight d7 now. Stonks these stonks. Where do you get that word from? What is my rating to have a WIM title? Not where it should be, Pippin Chook. <laughs> You're playing all of these moves from memory? Yes, I am. I'm not using any notes. The only notes, if you had to see my whole entire screen, like I, I don't have anything with me. I'm just speaking about the game. Um, I, uh, I learned this game probably back in 2013 or 14. You'll become a GM because of me? Well, look at you. That is a very nice thing. That's a very nice thing to say. Well, don't mock my rating. That's mean. All right, so B5. Now, my question is to you. Let's take a look at the developed pieces. How many pieces has white developed? One. With the queen on b3, two, three, four. We never count the pieces, uh, never count the pawns, because pawns are not considered pieces. Then we count black's pieces, one, two. So here we find that already black is two developing moves behind, which means he's playing two pieces down. And this in turn allows us the opportunity to sacrifice. It allows us the opportunity to sacrifice. There is compensation that comes with the sacrifice. Number one, two pawn compensation. Number two, an open black king to attack. And number three, the possibility that uh, black will never be able to develop their pieces properly and in turn either win a piece 
or another pawn, which will be three pawn compensation and enough to cover the piece. Pawns lives matter? Yes, they do. They do, Chris. <laughs> Thanks, Dying Pixels. Okay, so here we have b5. So, of course, we are going to use the piece here that we consider the least valuable, um, and that is the knight to capture the pawn. Between the bishop and the knight and the queen, we want to choose the knight to capture. Only because after capturing back, we, ha we are now taking with the bishop check. If we take with the queen, there's queen e7, and we don't want to trade off because we're down in material. When you are done in material and just started maybe a sacrificial combination, you want to avoid exchanging where possible because that's going to hamper your chances of creating complex complications as well as gaining an advantage. So here after knight d7, there's the most beautiful move I've ever seen in this game or in any game for that matter, and that is long castling. King safety, the connecting rooks, the rook on the open file, the rook is attacking probably the biggest pressure point in the position. This is just the best move. And after rook d8, now we have to focus once again. And I'm giving you a cheat sheet um, to tactics and middle games, and that is least active piece. So always look at which piece is doing the least in any given position and try to make it do the most. So which piece is not doing a lot right now? Which piece is not doing a lot? And I'm sure all of you would say this rook on h1. And how do we activate it without wasting too much time? How do we activate it without wasting too much time? And what do I mean by time? I mean, you have all the time in the world in terms of actual time, like on the clock. But in a game, every single move has to do something meaningful. There's no waiting around or you're not playing a game of dominoes or Scrabble. You, you can't just skip a move or play something that doesn't mean much. You gotta, you gotta really put some, some meaning into your moves. <laughs> take the knight? Exactly. So what we're going to do here is play rook takes d7. Big wow, because you just sacrificed a knight. And now you're sacrificing your rook. The rook has to take. And then we can introduce the other rook. And look at this, we are utilizing every single minor and major piece in the position. Both bishops are doing something, the queen is doing something, the rook is doing something. And look at how poorly placed black's pieces are. The bishop on f8 and the rook on h8, they're not doing anything. So here we're going to take a look at this position. We have to stop, of course, and after black plays queen e6, last attempt to exchange pieces, there is a mate in three. There is a mate in three. If you have seen th this before, uh, please take a step back and try not to ruin it for everyone else. But if you haven't, do try. Take a stab at this position. Let's go. You played long castles the other day? Long castles is obviously the answer to everything. <laughs> I'm sure Fisher won't mind if you get the date wrong. Well. I feel like the king on c1 could do more. Come on, Glamdring. It's not the c8 bishop, so we're fine. You can't remember the mate? Try, try giant pixels. You're gonna need that... You're gonna need that that bishop uh, fake Raja buff. It's not queen a4. Okay, so when considering a combination that is going to end the game or a tactic, you have to think about forceful moves. And in order of importance and also the order in which you should look for these moves or maybe choose your candidate moves, if you don't know what a candidate move is, please Google it. Number one, checks. Number two, captures. And number three, threats, attacking moves. So just add that to your cheat sheet of things you will learn today. I like this teamwork. It's good. Having seen it previously, you had to 
work it out again. Fair enough. Amazing yarn. Everyone is getting it right. Well, YouTube chat is really getting it. I don't know about Twitch chat. Okay, I'll show you in 15 seconds. Let's go. My next class is tonight in two hours. I'm giving a lecture on CoChess. It's the master class, so it's more private. If you go to CoChess.com, you'll be able to see what the master class entails. And then tomorrow at 2 p.m. CET, I will also be live, but I'll tell you more about it later. Spoiler even. Total cutie. If the first move is in check, then black can exchange queens. Exactly. So that should tell you um, enough about the position. So the first move is bishop takes d7, as you have already guessed. If you take with a queen, we lose the queen, rook takes a queen. So knight takes. And now the most beautiful move ever, queen b8. Forcing the knight to capture and rook d8. And covering that square, rook d8 mate. And we see beautiful end it's a beautiful game please let me know if you have any questions regarding that game the next game we're going to take a look at is between maxim vashil graf who was a 2300 at the time versus abdel sayed in 2003 so i know maxim or mvl is going is probably i don't know how old he is in this game um probably very young in his teens, maybe. Hi, Adam. Adam Clark. Why does your name look familiar? Hmm. Okay. So, let's begin with the game. Hi, everyone. Hi. Good to see you. New to stream? Oh, you're famous? Okay. I'm also famous? Okay. Okay, cool. He's born in the 90s. He's a 90s baby. Cool. Hey guys, good to see you. Thanks for joining. You're new to the class, that's great. Okay, so Maxim Vasilograph played the white pieces here and he actually took the W, he took the win against uh, Said. So we're gonna go over it. We have e4, e5, knight f3, d6. So let's just see how he ends up playing it. We have d4 being one of the best moves as, as we have seen um, in the Paul Morphy game and knight c6 previously. We saw this bishop g4 move, which is probably not the best. Um, but let's see how Maxim deals with this. He plays bishop b5, threatening this d5 pawn push and a6. He then captures. He captures on c6. And his plan is probably to uh, ruin the pawn structure here for black. And here we can see the problems that black will have. We have an isolated pawn on a6 and double pawns on the c file so let's see what happens queen trading and knight takes e5 knight to a6 i wonder what tournament this was i didn't check what tournament this was bishop takes h6 just completely obliterating what is going on what is going on so here he's just winning all the material he makes it look incredibly easy look at this play look at this play exchange down uh, black is the exchange down here rook to d2 just doubling those rooks of course f4 ro trading rooks you're not supposed to trade rooks but he trades rooks anyway look at those very very strong pawns on the fifth rank Antonio, you're Nikola Tesla on Twitch. You visited the stream today. That's amazing. 
Was this from ages ago or something? 2003, yeah. Black has no idea what he's doing. This reached an ending very fast. That's why endgames are very important. You have to learn your endgames. Focus. Nice, Sarah. You're also famous. Burritos are in every store. That's true. That's very true. 91. Okay. So he's he's 29 right now. Marble, Sarah. I think he was very low rated. He must be to not know what's going on here. I mean, this is just a whitewash. Look at that move, though. After bishop d5, I I wouldn't begin to know what's going on. And then rook g8, mate. So um, this is one way to not play the Philidor, Philidor defense. Um, I'm pretty sure that uh, Francois, Francois, um, André, Donican, Philidor is turning in his grave right now. Is Black a beginner? Of course. Manju man, you have a question? What is your question? That is very sweet. Asking me permission to ask a question. <laughs> I can also flip this board because Black took the win here. Here we go. Where am I from? I'm from South Africa. I'm from South Africa. Port Elizabeth, South Africa. Where are you guys from? I'm down so much. Let me trade rooks. Yep. That feels about right. You can also win playing the Philidor. You can lose playing the Philidor. You can win playing the Philidor. But what I'm trying to say here is the Philidor is not the problem. You are. I'm joking. I'm just saying that it's it's also better to focus on other parts of your game, such as your tactics, such as your middle game. Um, there's also so many different tips that you could take um, from just analyzing a game, such as the forceful moves that I mentioned, least active piece strategy, and end games are so, so important, guys. I'm joking, guys. Oh, <laughs> Morocco, India, amazing. You love A.B. de Villiers? That's great. <laughs> oh. UK Newcastle? I also didn't know it was Newcastle. What does WIM mean? Woman Intelligent Master. It's Woman International Master. Okay, so we're going to see it from Black's perspective because Black is a winner here. Okay, e4, e5, knight f3, d6, d4, takes, takes. Okay, here he captures knight f6, knight c3, bishop e7, bishop e2. Very normal stuff. Castle, castle. Malaysia, France. That's amazing. Let's get Chris. You're from Germany, I guess? Regular on your stream from Sweden. Amazing, Mikhail. <laughs> LED lights. Exactly. All about those RGB LED. Good to know I don't stalk you too closely on Instagram. What if I'm just pretending to not know? Omnipresent. Oh, wow. <laughs> Poland. Mars? You're from Mars? Me too. There's a country named South Africa on Mars. Germany power here. Awesome. Tag. Is tag the correct word? Hello? Is that right? My new laptop has RGB. Oh, it's probably added $100 overall price, but it's worth it. What a flex. You're just here to flex. Stop flexing. Castle. Rook to e8 and f4. So what I wanted to show you right in the beginning as well. Oops. Um, let me just do this. Okay. What I wanted to show you was right in the beginning. After e5, knight f3, d6. Um, 
one way to play it after something like bishop to f i think it's d4 um black has often played this move i don't think it's in this position maybe it's knight c3 knight c3 f5 but i know f5 is a main idea f5 um is an idea in some positions uh where black is playing the fullador defending e5 with the pawn and then playing f5 but this, I think, is a whole different ballpark, and I'll have to do some research on that. I should come back to you. Okay, let's go back to the present position. I honestly don't know why I did that. All right, so f4, <laughs> and bishop to f8, putting pressure on e4, and bishop f3, just defending. c5 is brave. I would never leave this pawn here as a backward pawn, um, because what is going to defend that pawn? Knight goes to e2. Is he going to push d5 at some point? Who knows? h3, bishop to d7, and g4. I would be incredibly intimidated because, first of all, peace coordination is so important. And this is a 2200 versus a 2300. Irene, Charisma, Sukandar versus Jana Krivek. Two female players up against each other. Here, h6. What's going on? Only I've learned. <laughs> this Philidor looks more promising than the last two. Very true. Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate it. Oh my goodness. Well, don't say that. Good evening, Cappy. So bishop to g2 and b5. b5 sacrificing a pawn? But white doesn't take the pawn. So captures, captures, knight to h7 and h4. All right, very interesting. I really thought, oh, maybe there's no knight takes b5 here. Let's see. Knight takes b5. And queen b6. What is our plan here? What is our plan? Ah, oh, we're just going to take. Okay, makes sense. Makes sense. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So g5 takes, takes knight h7, h4, knight to e5, protecting b5 with the bishop, knight e5, taking advantage of this isolated pawn as well, knight to g3, and bishop to g4, just putting pressure on the queen. And now we're going all in. Going after the king. Captures, captures g6 is a risky move thank goodness for this bishop on f8 right right h5 king h8 takes takes and knight to f6 whoa if you were playing black here what would you do what would you do let me see what the continuation is Resign? Wow, guys. Wow. Honestly, I don't know what I'm going to do with you, Twitch chat. <laughs> you gotta you gotta be better than this. You gotta be better than this. <laughs> knight takes knight. And after G takes. If I was black, I'd cry a bit. True. But remember, black is taking the point here. Flip the table. Hmm. You can't resign. That's for sure. You're gonna play b4? No, focusing on the wrong side of the board. <laughs> You'll pray. <laughs> you guys are very, very funny. I love it. I really, really love it. Go into the corner and cry. Wow. I'm a 40 elo player. Go to move a piece and accidentally knock my king over every game. MCJ? Are you okay? Are you alright? Accidentally knock the pieces off. Gonna shuffle the piece. <laughs> this isn't a deck of cards. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
of your online D&D &D session? Oh, wow. Offer a draw. All right, okay, enough trolling. We're going to take... And then after white captures back, we're going to take the knight, even though our king is wide open. Rook takes, looks terrifying, but we're just going to swing our queen across to h7 to protect that h5 square. And after bishop to g5, that is when we throw in the kitchen sink. Where do we go from here? Where do you come from? Where do you go? Where do you come from? Cotton Eye Joe. No. <laughs> oh, that's what you said, Screws? Nice. Good job. Good job. I did see that. <laughs> Start dancing the cotton-eyed Joe jig. Interesting. That's a song. She's a joker? Not that... That's really bad. Okay, fine. I take it back. My goodness. You guys are so mean. <laughs> okay. We've been up for 50 minutes. Bishop f6. Um, Well, your bishop's on f8. I don't know how it's going to get to f6, to be honest. Bishop h6? Well, then... There might be f7. Oh, there's no f7. So I have to be careful, I think. So here the movie's knight f7. Knight f7. So we want to put pressure on that beautiful bishop there on g5. If we can trade pieces, we're well on our way to victory because black here is a piece up. And when you are material up, you want to make sure that you exchange pieces. So the general rule there is when you are pieces up, exchange pieces and not pawns. When you are pieces down, you're going to exchange pawns and not pieces. Quick maths. Wait, black is winning? Yes, black is winning. Of course. Very winning. It's at least plus two. Say again, please. <laughs> so when you are pieces up, exchange pieces and not pawns. Do not consider pieces, uh, pawns to be pieces. So pieces, I mean knights, bishops, rooks, queens, obviously not your king. So when you are up in material, exchange your pieces and not your pawns. Because what happens if all your pawns are gone and you're a bishop up, you can't just checkmate with a lone bishop. You'd rather be a bishop up and a couple pawns maybe equal, gobble up those... Pawns of the bishop and then queen your own pawns. You want to learn the Berlin opening? Goodness. I don't know if I can teach the Berlin today, but I know for sure that if you keep on um, tuning into these coacher sessions, you will find the Berlin at some point. And when you are down in material, you can exchange pawns and not pieces because maybe your opponent is a knight up. And if you exchange all the pawns, your opponent's like, where's my pawns? I've got a knight, but I can't checkmate you. It's a draw. So you can save the game. It's never over. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, thanks. No one should want to learn the book. Why? So that Alex is going to teach a lesson on Rook and Pawn Endgames this weekend? Isn't that your turf? Who's Alex? A Jesse defense. <laughs> Funny. Oh, Alex has done it. Okay. Well, maybe he will cover more advanced topics of uh, endings. Rook endings. Rook and pawn endings. Maybe more advanced stuff. Alrighty, so we have knight f7. Rook to f1. And that is the end. It's not the end. What does black play? He captures the bishop because we want to exchange, of course. Rook takes. And now it's looking a little dangerous for black. What does black do? The move you suggested before that. Well, prior. 
Bishop to h6, quite nice. White plays rook to h5, pending the bishop. And now, drum roll, what's gonna happen? Nice, you guys are getting it. So when I actually wait for an answer, you don't give me an answer. But when I don't wait for an answer, you give me the right answer. This is not right. Rook g8 and gg, love it. I love it, guys. Good job. You guys are doing wonderfully. Honestly, you don't even need me. You're probably just here for the amazing entertainment. And because it's a nice place to just gather and enjoy ourselves together. <laughs> Alrighty. Rook g8. Too easy. Give us hard problems. I give you advanced tactics all the time. Tomorrow afternoon? Best beware. Tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m. CET, I'm back. Same place, not the same time, but I'm back speaking about the King's Gambit. Not the Queen's Gambit, the King's Gambit. Spin off from the series The Queen's Gambit. But we'll talk tactics then. I will bring all the difficult tactics, and if you can solve them, then I'll bow down to you. Rook g8. <laughs> King's Gambit. So you better be back here 2 p.m. CET tomorrow. Rook g8, rook to f2, thank you for the queen. Rook takes and bishop check, winning the rook. Resign. Resign. Beautiful stuff. What a beautiful game, don't you think? That was pretty good. That was pretty good. Between two female players played in 2007, I think. Let me check. 2007, exactly. Quite nice. Quite nice. I enjoyed that one. Hope you guys enjoyed it as well. Where are you streaming on Twitch? I am streaming on twitch.tv forward slash coaches. So if you type in coaches on the Twitch page, you should be able to find the channel. I also have my own streaming platform, which you could probably find on my social media. I will not mention it. So it'll be a bit of a treasure hunt for y'all. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for being here. It was a lot of fun talking about the Philidor. I was on the fence about the opening because I knew there was just so much to say, especially um, kind of covering uh, my own side with regards to whether it's a good opening for club players or not. And I think it is. I really think that any opening a playable opening, whether dubious or not, is indeed playable, just that. Um, but if you want to focus on anything regarding your chess, the best way to improve, I believe, is just working on, excuse me, tactics. Um, there's also a lot of tactical resources on different online platforms. Chess24, Chess Tempo, Lee Chess, uh, Chess.com. There's so many different um, platforms, puzzles. Also a lot of books out there, like the woodpecker method. Um, but also just working on general principles, because the thing is, it's not that you're not able to calculate. Maybe a calculation is an issue for you, but it could also be um, that it's just you're not seeing. You don't know what to look for. You don't you don't know what to, to keep your eyes open for when those principles come with um, reading books and looking at games, watching online tournaments, like the skilling tournament that just happened. Um, I know that there's gonna be a bunch more tournaments coming up. I think the next one is starting on the 26th of December. So that's gonna be a lot of fun to watch. And uh, I know there'll be some huge involvement from the coaches members as well, leading masterclasses uh, cross boards. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, but I'll see you really, really soon, guys. Um, I will be teaching a masterclass in two hours. If you want to join that, go to coaches.com and check out the masterclasses. It's all marked down 50% off. Um, I believe it's Reluca, Kostya and myself who are giving masterclasses. And uh, it's $6. It's only $6 for an hour. And it's a private session. You get given a code um, to watch and to comment. 
and to interact you get more of a a one-on-one -on -one situation but it's it's a small group of people and it's going to be a lot of fun and then i'll see you again uh, for a public stream session 2 p.m cet speaking about the king's gambit but tonight i'll be speaking about introduction to rook endings so see you there bye guys bye <laughs>